two friends in one shared dream to climb the unclimbed northeast ridge of the Everest. It was in the month of May 1982 when the British duo Peter Boardman, a climbing instructor, and Joe Tasker, a former seminar student, set out to tackle the pinnacles, a fearsome triad of shark's teeth jutting out of Everett's northeast ridge at nearly 26,000 feet. Setting off from camp on May 17, 1982, they disappeared on the highest mountain in the world. Peter Boardman and Joe Tasker were not inexperienced climbers, they were two of the brightest mountaineers of their time, having climbed many peaks before trying the ridge. Boardman, who was 31 and married at the time, had reached the summit of Mount Everest on the 1975 British assault of the southwest face from Nepal, and in 1979 climbed the Kanchenjunga, the world's third highest mountain, without oxygen. He also ran the International School of Mountaineering in Laysen, Switzerland, after its two previous directors were killed in mountain accidents. Tasker, on the other hand, was by no means inferior to him. He was 33 and single at the time of the mission, and also had an impressive mountaineering record. This included the first British winter ascent of the north face of the Eiger in Switzerland, and as Boardman, he had also climbed the Kanchenjunga without oxygen. Both climbers were known in the mountaineering community for their two men ascent of the sheer west wall of the Changabang peak in the Indian Himalayas. Boardman prize winning book about their climb, The Shining Mountain, was one of the best performing books in the mountaineering literature. They were two of the most promising alpinists the sport had ever seen, but fate was not kind to them. They decided to climb the northeast ridge of the Everest, as it was still unclimbed at the time, and they decided to do so without the help of Sherpas. It was an audacious expedition, but it was not the first time for both of them, and so they put together a team. The expedition consisted of Boardman, Chris Bonington, Dick Renshaw, and Joe Tasker, who also had responsibility for filming the expedition documentary. It was also supported by expedition doctors Charles Clark and Adrian Gordon, and Chinese base camp staff. The four mountaineers had light equipment, allowing them to pass on harder routes and to reduce the weight of their backpacks. They also decided to try the ascent with no oxygen for the same reason. This practice was not new to the world of mountaineering, but without oxygen, the Everest was going to be an even bigger challenge because of its high altitude. The permits needed for the climb were obtained after the Chinese government began reluctantly opening its part of the mountain to foreign expeditions. For the four mountaineers, the ridge was an obvious choice for shooting a documentary. It was elegant, and the fact that it hadn't been climbed yet conferred to it a feeling of mystery and unknown. The team could only evaluate the difficulty of the climb on pictures, but they considered climbing the ridge hard, but possible. The northeast ridge rises two miles from the Rapula to the northeast shoulder and the junction with the north ridge. From there, the summit is almost another mile away. The crooks of the northeast ridge are three pinnacles, a formation of steep rocks. The rocks are located at around 7,800, 8,100 and 8,200 meters above sea level and are therefore already in the death zone, in which people cannot usually recover even at rest. Usually, routes tend to avoid this area as it is considered one of the hardest sections of the Everest due to its conformation and treacherous terrain. However, in the northeast ridge climb, it is impossible to avoid this passage, and so, in 1982, Boardman, Renshaw, Bonington and Tasker were getting ready to climb the Three Pinnacles. The expedition arrived at base camp on the 16th of March 1982, and here they began the slow process of acclimatization, slowly moving their base camps up the Rongbuk Glacier where still today many routes set camp to reach the more advanced camps on the Everest. By April 1982, 
they had reached the advanced camp on the northeast ridge. This camp was not as populated as the others, as most routes are on the northern side. However, this did not bring down the morale of the team, as they all had a wry sense of humor and were known to keep life at base camp light and fun. From the base camp, they started climbing the ridge, setting up two snow caves, respectively at 6,850 meters and 7,256 meters. These snow caves allowed them to have shelter and rest while trying to reach the three pinnacles. In early May, their third and last snow cave was set up at 7,850 meters. From there, the first pinnacle seemed an easy task. The team was working in harmony, but they could not expect what happened next. On the 10th of May 1982, Renshaw experienced what was later diagnosed as a minor stroke, probably due to the high altitude and the lack of oxygen. They were climbing the first pinnacle, but Renshaw wasn't able to continue any further, and so he returned to base camp. Unfortunately, his fate wasn't done with him, and while he was resting at base camp, Renshaw experienced a second stroke. His life was at risk, and they decided that it was best if he returned to the city with the expedition doctor to receive medical treatment. The expedition was starting to crumble, but the three remaining climbers decided to push on and continue the climb of the pinnacles. At this point of the expedition, Bonington realized that he couldn't do it anymore. He wasn't able to continue further without the use of supplementary oxygen, and so the team was down to two. Bonington didn't quit the expedition altogether, but instead he switched to a support role, following the two remaining climbers from base camp. He also intended to climb the North Col and wait there for Tasker and Boardman while they made their last push for the Three Pinnacles. Little did he know, he would have never seen them again. At the dawn of the 15th of May 1982, Tasker and Boardman left the advanced base camp making one last desperate attempt to conquer the Three Pinnacles. By the end of the same day, they had reached the second snow cave that they had personally set up in the time prior to this last attempt, and everything seemed to be going smoothly. By the next day, the 16th of May, they had reached the third and last snow cave, set up at 7,850 meters. That evening, they made the usual radio contact with Bonington, who was following them from the advanced base camp. This was the last radio contact registered with the base camp. On the 17th of May, they moved past the first pinnacle and slowly started climbing the second one. Bonington was following every move made by his teammates from base camp, watching through binoculars the two red-suited men, easily distinguishable in the white scenery. According to the reports given to the Chinese Mountaineering Association, Bonington affirms seeing the two climbers disappear at dusk just below the second of the two major pinnacles, having reached 8,250 meters of altitude after a 14 hours climb. Bonington first thought of them setting up for the night, and without much overthinking he went back to his tent, waiting for a radio contact that would never happen. For the next four days, there were no signs of Boardman and Tasker, and Bonington was eagerly waiting for that radio call, but everything remained silent. On the 21st of May, four days after the disappearance of the two climbers, Bonington decided to give it one last chance, trying to rescue his teammates. He was too weak to climb the route they went up on, so he traveled up the Kenshung Valley to search the other side of the ridge for any signs of the corpses, but there were no signs of their presence. Heartbroken, he began his descent to base camp, which he reached at the start of June. Tasker and Boardman appeared as vanished from the Everest, and nobody could explain what could have happened up there. Many of the expedition that followed tried looking for the corpses, but in vain. In 1995, 
the complete ridge was climbed by a Japanese expedition. They also came across a body which was initially thought to be Joe Tasker. However, upon re-examining all the evidence, Chris Bonington concluded that the corpse was Boardman's. The body was described by the Japanese climbers as sitting peacefully at the base of the second pinnacle. What happened to Boardman is still unknown to this day, and his corpse was never found.